Okay, we've talked about a variety of tricks that birds have evolved in order to reduce drag during fi uh, flight. But those tricks are still not going to eliminate drag. So ultimately, birds have to fight drag by adding power, which will enable them then to fly. Now once in the air and horizontal, the pectoralis muscle and the supracoracoideus muscles are the main ones needed to move the wing downward and upward to generate power. The primaries and secondaries will provide both propulsion and lift. The lift is directed pretty much straight upward where the secondaries uh, are maintaining a fairly constant angle of attack during the wing beat cycle. Remember now, lift is perpendicular to the direction of airflow over the airfoil. But the lift is directed both up and forward nearer the wing tips because the, the greater rotation or twisting of the primaries near the wing tip. So the, uh, uh, even the outermost emarginated primaries and some of the big, larger birds can also supply forward thrust because of the relatively broad trailing vein on those individual feathers may bend upward and then act like mini propellers uh, during the drown, downstroke. Let's take a look at a red knot in flight. So here's some footage from the BBC of a red knot flying in the air. Uh, notice its body is a cigar-shaped, streamline-shaped, resi low resistance to air movement. When the wings are on the upstroke, they bend in toward the body to reduce resistance, and on the downstroke, they extend out. Now, the lift attained by the secondaries, for the most part, is pretty much direct upward, whereas the lift out by the primaries, where they bend downward, uh, is both forward and up. So how much power, then, is needed to fly at different speeds? What does this relationship look like for a fixed-wing aircraft? What you can do is break the amount of power needed down into a couple of components. Profile power is the amount of power needed to fight profile drag. And, of course, the faster you go, faster, 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 the more and more and more drag due to the profile of the body is going to build up. It's going to increase exponentially. Pretty soon it'll be so hard to fight that drag, it's going to take way too much power to fly. The second kind of power is called induced power, which is really high at low flight speeds and then decreases exponentially. Now, induced power is needed to fight induced drag, where air is flowing in directions other than direct, uh, straight over the wing, and, and to fight gravity. I mean, if you're going zero miles an hour and you're flying, well, you must be hovering, and that takes a lot of energy. So if you put those two powers together, add them up, just put the two curves together, one plus the other, you get the resulting curve uh, being the total flight power needed. So that's the total amount of power a flying machine is going to need to move at a particular airspeed. Now there's three instructive points on this curve that I want you to pay attention to. The first is, way at the left, the amount of power it, it is required to fly at very low speeds, like hovering, is great. It costs a lot to fly zero miles an hour. Now the second point to notice on this curve is that there's a definite minimum, labeled here UMP, which corresponds to point two on the curve. A bird can remain in the air for the longest period of time on a given amount of fuel at that particular speed. There's the minimum power needed to fly. Third point shows that there's a speed that will maximize the range of a flying object. This is the speed that will allow it to cover the greatest distance on a given amount of fuel. That's different than the, the, the minimum power needed to fly, right? They don't necessarily correspond. You find U min by looking for the lowest point on the curve. There's the minimum power needed but you find the maximum range by looking at the, for a point on the curve somewhere that minimizes what? The power to speed ratio, or maximizes, if you want, the speed to power ratio. The value on the x-axis, speed, divided by the value on the y-axis, power. You want to maximize that. You want to go really, really fast for no fuel. That'll get you um, the farthest. 
Now remember, we're trying to get the greatest distance here per unit energy. That's sort of like getting the greatest miles per gallon. That means we want to find a point on our power curve that has the greatest x to y ratio, right? So speed, let's say it's recorded as miles per hour, would be divided by the power needed, recorded as, say, gallons of fuel used per hour, which, as you can see, if you take one divided by the other, this will equal miles per gallon when speed's divided by power, because the hours cancel out. So, all points on a straight line have exactly the same y to x ratio, right? Or x to y ratio. Because all points on the same line, any two points on any one straight line are going to have exactly the same ratio. So the y to x ratio being the same on every line, these two points right here have exactly the same ratio of y to x. These two on this line have exactly the same ratio of y to x. So what we have to do is find a point on our curve that has the greatest ratio of x to y. So which point on our power curve, right, lets you go as fast as possible with the least amount of power? Is it this point here on the curve way out on the right? No, because that's on a line that's also a slope, right, that's greater than a point on another line with a lower slope. So you try to find the point with the on a line with the lowest slope, that's the greatest y to x ratio. And there is your point, number three. So that's maximum range. So you want to get farthest, you only have a certain amount of fuel left in your gas tank, that's the speed you want to go. That's all fixed wing aircraft theory. But the fact that minimum flight cost also occurs at intermediate speeds for birds was substantiated by Vance Tucker, his experiments in the 70s documenting that uh, oxygen consumption in budgerigars, these little parakeets, uh, was highest um, at the low, low flight speeds and high flight speeds and minimum in the middle. Okay, he flew birds in wind tunnels, put little oxygen mask on them, and uh, got those data. Now here is what such an experiment looks like today at the University of Montana's flight lab. Pretty cool. Magpie flying while wearing oxygen masks. Okay, at different flight speeds, so you can measure the oxygen consumption at the different speeds. Well, Tucker, it turns out, found that a bird's minimum oxygen consumption is indeed at intermediate speeds. Pretty cool. Pretty much like a fixed wing aircraft theory would have predicted. Now, Ken Dial and Andy B. Winter, Brett Tobolsky, and Doug Warwick decided um, they wanted to look more directly at the power needed to fly because oxygen consumption is kind of an indirect measure. So these guys subsequently measured mechanical power by, uh, used by magpies flying by uh, the use of strain gauges glued to the humerus. So the strain gauge will actually measure the amount of bending in the bone, therefore the amount of power the muscles exerting on that bone and not have this indirect measure of oxygen consumption. And their own measurements of magpies and starlings plus their reanalysis of some other published work showed amazingly flat curves from most all birds studied to that point in time, all except the budgerigar which was studied by Tucker and there's the budgerigar data superimposed on top. And they began wondering, what the heck is going on here? Is, is Tucker fudging his data or something? We don't see the same thing at all. So what's going on? Then subsequent work by Brett Tobolsky and others show that different bird species do differentially well at compensating for drag at different speeds. speeds. So Tobolsky and these others flew bird species with very different wing shapes and wing flexibility and showed that the cockatiel's power curve is really quite u-shaped not unlike tucker's budgerigar curve while a dove is sort of intermediate and a magpie relatively flat tucker merely happened to pick a parakeet like bird with very little flexibility in its wing shape and that resulted in a power curve that was relatively u-shaped just like that in a fixed wing aircraft so why are the power curves for birds generally a lot flatter than the curves for planes. Well, the answer is that bird wings can change shape 
to deal with drag at different speeds. So the birds are not holding their wings in exactly the same way at different air speeds. Airplanes can't change their wing shapes. Moreover, different bird species do differentially well at compensating for drag at different speeds. So that's the take home lesson here. Okay, let's end our discussion of powered flight by considering takeoff. Small birds can jump into the air and get enough reaction with airfoil uh, to stay airborne. But larger birds have to run into the wind with their wings out or dive off of cliffs. I mean, uh, heavy wing loaders like vultures are even known to decrease their weight by vomiting before they have an emergency takeoff. But basically, the propulsion for takeoff comes from sources besides the bird's own wing beat. Typically, the birds jump to take off, and here's a brief video clip from the flight lab to show that. Leg thrust, vroom, downbeat of the wing, boom, together, airborne. Once the bird jumps and initiates its first downstroke, right, then what happens when it's the first upstroke? Why doesn't the bird crash back toward earth there? You know, it gets some upward lift with the downbeat, and why doesn't it go down with the upbeat in the wing? And the answer is that they tuck their wings in tight toward the body on the upstroke, see, to minimize reaction with the air. And you look at these high-speed photos of chickadee, really impresses upon you uh, the differences in the surface area exposed to air on the downbeat. See, this chickadee here is coming down on the downbeat versus the upbeat where they, oh, they tuck that wing in really tight toward the body on the upbeat there, and then way out on the downbeat. And this photo really shows another feature, right? It's not just flexion and extension of the arm, extension on the downbeat, flexion on the upbeat, but the way the feathers lie relative to one another is interesting too. Remember the structure of flight feathers, they overlap so that the narrow leading edge overlaps with the broader trailing edge of the feather in front of it, right? So the asymmetry in feathers means they'll open like Venetian blinds on the upstroke, right? The air's going to seep through and then shoop, slap shut on the downstroke because they slap against one another. So this lets air pass through as if opening a Venetian blind on the upstroke and then sh shuts as it, the Venetian blind closes on the downstroke. Let's consider hovering for a second. Hummingbirds tend to modify their wing stroke by generating upward lift on both the down and the upstroke. So they alternate up and back with up and forward lift vectors. They have a great ability to rotate the, their arm to produce the lift on the upstroke and the downstroke. And their wings beat really rapidly, like 80 times per second which they can do because they're so small, so they don't have a kinetic energy problem that a big, you know, goose would or something like that. Look at this calliope hummingbird. Notice both the downstroke and the upstroke generate lift. Downstroke, upstroke, downstroke, upstroke. So Warwick and others studied air movement patterns over a hummingbird wing in a sophisticated fashion by using digital particle imaging velocimetry. They studied the aerodynamics of hummingbird hovering that way. This method couples a digital camera that uses a laser light source and a computer to track the circulating microscopic oil droplets that are seeded in the air. And they basically found by measuring lift forces during the wing beat cycle that about 75% of the lift in a hummingbird is generated on the downstroke and about 25% on the upstroke. Now, insects can manage 50% or half of their lift on downstroke and upstroke. Most other birds can't do squat on the upstroke. So bird flight, in general, is much more complicated than flight in a fixed-wing aircraft because the wings are able to move in so many ways constantly. And so what you really see with birds are these weird toroidal vortex rings being generated with every wing beat, you know, and so it's hard to kind of look for streamline, laminar, direct, simple flow over an airfoil when you're talking about bird flight. Just the patterns are amazing. But for our purposes, I think we have the basic understanding of how uh, birds get airborne. I'll close then with one last tidbit. 
Flight can provide some insight into why a bird's neck is so flexible. This coal, this strange bird, shows the ability of a bird to turn its head. Look at that 180 degree turn there. The usual story you see in textbooks is that their eyes are real big and fixed in their sockets, so they have to have really good head mobility. Well, it's probably more related to flight. And experiments that Ken Dial did in the hallway right here at University of Montana showed that if he, take, if he took a pigeon and kind of held it like a football, turned it upside down, and then threw it down the hall, and looked at the, at the high-speed cinematography, you always notice that its head is upright virtually all the time. So uh, basically this suggests the birds need a great deal of flexibility in, the, in their neck to keep the cockpit steady. That's in fact why it's called a cockpit. In the past, people would take, way, way back in the early days of airplane flying, people would take roosters, cocks, up into the cockpit with them and when uh, you'd get fogged in and not know whether your plane is level or not, you just look at the rooster and see where the head is, and that's your sign of how to level the plane out. So that, hence the name cockpit.